Bud. Whoopsie. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well done. And he's back up. Oh, a day in the life of a dung beetle. First, you have to roll a dung ball, then you've got to find a lady friend, then you've got to push her around, plus the dung, be the dung ball. Oh, she must be feeling fairly motion sick at this point, but she's there for a very important reason. She changes the shape of the ball ever so slightly, so that if he does drop it or let it go on a hill, she acts almost like a stopper to keep it from rolling away from him. That's about the only purpose that I can see for her presence on this dung ball. She will, once they get to a suitable digging spot, this is amazing, he's rolled a very impressive dung ball. Well done, buddy. You've been successful with your morning. He's definitely wooed her with his impressive industrial actions this morning. They're going to go and find a nice safe spot, at which point both of them will bury the ball. They will mate. She will lay her eggs within the center of it. And then they will go off on their separate ways and leave their offspring. They have at least provided for them in the form of dung food for when those eggs and larvae do hatch. Now, the, dung, the, the larvae of a dung beetle that size is a, quite a large animal. It's probably about the size of my pinky finger. So not a small creature. I'm going to go forward a bit so we can continue to watch his progress. I've done walks with guests where we have watched dung beetles for about two hours before. Just absolutely fascinated by the way in which they work. Here is he. Oh, he's found himself in such a tricky spot. Is that okay there, Jandre? Hmm? Um, he's, he's, he's stuck. He's stuck against the log. Oh, no. Is he gonna try and dig down? He is digging. I, I can't quite decide if he's digging because he's trying desperately to push this ball. No, he's definitely digging. He's, I think he's decided this is the place for the dung ball to be. Oh, this is very cool. We don't often get to see this. He's also covered in some kind of mite. It's common to see mites on dung beetles, but I've never seen them to quite this extent. The mites keep them clean and stop them from... their joints from getting too covered in dung and dirt. This is awesome. He's going to dig it right down. Look at him go. Snoop has said that this brings whole new meaning to picking up a lady. Um, Mr. Dung Beetle, I don't think that was quite deep enough, to be completely honest. I think you might have been overly ambitious there. What on earth is all over him? They're like, they're not mites, they're like flies. That's a first for me. I've never seen that. I'm going to have to look that phenomenon up. Look at him dig. Come on, lady. Jump off the dung ball and give him a hand. Now, Mike was wondering, do dung beetles ever take a day off? And I think perhaps Mike, he's, uh, well, he has earned a bit of time off after he manages to plant this particular dung ball. It's still not deep enough, Mr. Dung Beetle. That's not hidden well enough. They have to dig them down because honey badgers are going to honey badgers are going to come through and dig. There is something of a tree situation in front of my vehicle. What I can do is reposition completely so that we come from the other side and maybe we'll get a better view from that side. We do have a, a monkey orange problem in front of us. We'll go, we'll turn around and we'll view it from the side. That might work a little better. I really want to see him dig it down. I've never seen the completed process right up until that point. Oh. 
It's just in this monkey orange block. <laughs> I'm going to do an Austin Powers style U-turn. Chandra, how's your view from here? Is that slightly better? There we go. I think he stopped. I, there he is. Look, he's digging underneath there. I was about to say he stopped for a break. <laughs> it's almost like he's tried to dig it underneath and the dung ball has fallen on him. Now he can't get out. That's not the case, though. He's just digging it down. I thought, I really honestly thought the females helped the males dig the dung balls down, but she doesn't seem to be showing any inclination to give him a hand. Interesting question from Nok Chur. We've spoken a lot recently about the mites that cover the dung beetles and actually how essential they are to a dung beetle's survival. As the Australians discovered when they tried to when they tried to transport dung beetles from Africa across to Australia to deal with the cow dung problem and then put them in quarantine and destroyed all of the mites on their backs and promptly all the dung beetles died. So the mites are essentially a part of their survival, but Noctura would like to know whether or not those mites are within the dung ball themselves or if they are acquired as the dung beetle goes about its life, since obviously the larvae won't necessarily have them. It's a really good question, and it's one that I honestly do not know the answer to. I imagine that those mites are around the dung ball. Perhaps some of them fall off the adult dung beetles whilst this process continues, and then sort of hatch or grab onto the larvae once it's metamorphosized or pupated. I'm so sorry, Franklin. Did I interrupt you? Did I interrupt you or did you interrupt me? Either way, they definitely want to have a very loud conversation. It's like being in a marketplace, talking to each other across the road. You guys can use inside voices. You're very close together. <laughs> Still digging it down. This is incredible. So the way in which it works is that she will lay her eggs within this dung ball itself. And the question remains, does she dig down into it and then lay her eggs or, and then cover it back up again? And that seems to me to be the most likely scenario the way in which she's going to do that. As I said, those dung beetle larvae are definitely attractive prospects for any animal out here. They're high in protein, they're large, they're defenseless, which is why this dung ball is such a crucial part of their survival. Honey badgers in particular are known to enjoy a snack of dung beetle larvae, and you very often found, find dung balls that have been dug up and broken open by honey badgers. Look what she's doing. She's crawling up onto the top. I'm sure that she does dig a little bit of a hole, lay her eggs, and then cover it up again. That makes the most sense to me in the way in which this would work. He's got such hard work to do. Doesn't this seem like a silly way to go about this? Don't you think it would have been more sensible to have the dung ball on the side, dig a hole, and then roll the dung ball in? Or is there a reason that he does it? Oh, no, I suppose there is a very clear reason why he does it this way. He doesn't want somebody else to come along and steal it. And dung beetles do steal from each other. Sorry, bear with me one second. Brent's just trying to get hold of me. Standing by. Copy that, Brent. I didn't see any tracks coming out on Twin Dams, but the Misi have walked up and down all along that road, so they might have been underneath there.
went just updating me on his search for Karula. This is quite a thrilling sighting, though. I'm now quite determined that we need to see this through, at least. I have no idea how long it's going to take him to dig this bo dung ball down. I think, I mean, he's about halfway down by now. Uh, typically, the dung balls get dug down about this deep. So what is that? That's roughly six inches down into the ground. This is a particularly broad, I mean, this dung ball, I know you can't see exactly to, uh, according to scale. It's just a little bit smaller than a tennis ball that he's trying to get down into the soil. So there you go, Jacob. You were wondering about the diameter of the ball. And I'm just going to turn my game drive channel down. There's a lot of, lot of chattering happening there. Jacob, it's about just a bit smaller than a tennis ball in terms of diameter. So he's done some very impressive work. Look at him go. This seems like such an impractical way of doing things, and yet, and yet he's already got through more than half, or, or more than half of that dung ball is underground. She looks as though she's doing something with her front legs, and I wonder if that's not preparing to, or preparing a space in which to lay her eggs. She definitely isn't giving him any help here in terms of digging it down. But she's doing something. Now, Megan, as far as I know, although we know this is the female from her behavior, as far as I know, there's no physiological differences that we can see or external physiological differences that we can see that differentiate between a male and a female dung beetle. The only possibility, Megan, is that perhaps the male's front legs are a bit more prominent because they need to use them not just for rolling the dung ball and pushing it around, but also in order to fight off other males that will attempt to steal their dung ball. And there are certain dung beetles that do that. They wait for one male to put in all the hard work, and then they go and they flick him with their front feet and send him flying, and promptly race off with his, with their dung, with his dung ball, only to be pursued for quite a considerable distance by a very indignant and irate male that's put in all the hard work in the first place. You just see every now and again dirt going flying from underneath there. Already he's managed to drop it down another couple of centimeters. I completely agree, Clayton. It is the one huge draw card of these, or one of the huge draw cards of these live safaris. Whilst you can watch something like this on a documentary, and yes, it'll be edited, and yes, you'll probably not have to sit through some of the more boring bits, not that this is in any way boring, but sometimes you, you sort of drive around for a long time and wait for something to happen. Either way, when it is live, it makes such a huge difference, which is what, the, what Clayton was saying that it's so fascinating to watch something like this from beginning to end. I almost feel as though you get something like a sports game. That you can't, you can watch a recorded sports game, but it's not quite the same in terms of excitement. The other thing is, of course, that we can't script or predict or edit out exactly what's going to happen. So it gives you the best possible reflection, or rawest possible reflection of the way in which life works out here. She's definitely been busy doing something. She might not be helping him dig, but she's, her front legs have been working the whole time. And Siberia Zumi was wondering about the lifespan of a dung beetle. Now, there's so many different species of dung beetle out here. As far as I know, some of them longer live than others, some for a couple of months, others for up to a year or more, depending on the way in which the seasons go. Now, for these guys, they probably have a lifespan of about a year. Once they are finished with this whole process and once the dry season starts, most of the adults will die off. You never see adult dung beetles during the dry season. And it becomes the time of life for the larva to start taking over and become the new generation of dung beetles in the future. And what we're essentially watching is a perfect example of a life cycle at work. I'm totally mesmerized by it. I can't believe how much he's managed to cover in the space of time. It's basically, I mean, you can barely see that dung ball now. It's 
all but disappeared. But he's still got a long way to go. He seems to have taken a break for the moment. One can hardly blame him for that. You can just sort of imagine him lying there. <laughs> Just imagine him lying there underneath the dung ball, taking a bit of a breather and wondering, maybe even contemplating his existence and thinking, is this really all worth it? Is this what life is really about? Perhaps he's going to, after this, go off and buy a motorbike and head off on a cross-country trip, have a bit of a midlife crisis. Because the lot of a dung beetle's life is not a pleasant one. Well, not unpleasant, I suppose. Joe, Joe, you, it's not a stupid question at all. It's actually a really good question. Insects don't have lungs. They have, oh, there he goes again. It's getting harder and harder down there. <laughs> they don't have lungs. They have an open blood cavity known as a hemocell. And that hemocell, because they're fairly relatively small in size, the hemocell allows for the diffusion of gases uh, most insects have some kind of spherical-like hole around their abdomens that allow for the entrance of oxygen and the exit of carbon dioxide. So a very different system to our lung, heart, blood vessel structure that mammals have. It's one of the unifying physiological features that defines an insect as an insect. So it's an open cavity rather than a, a network of little blood vessels. Look at him go. So he's underneath there. He's taking in, he's not completely surrounded by dirt, so he's not going to suffocate. He'll be letting in, and they only need small amounts of oxygen when compared to us. So he'll be quite happily breathing about underground. I wish I knew exactly what she was doing. She's sort of patting the dung ball down. She's not being helpful at all. I'm going to try, now that this dung ball has started to disappear further down into the ground, I'm going to try and see if we can't sneak even closer and see if we can't figure out exactly what it is this lady is doing. It would be the most heartbreaking way that I see this scenario ending is another male coming in and mating with her while he's down there trying to dig the hole into the ground, <laughs> leaving him to do all of the hard work. He's working so hard for a little dung beetle. We are being very closely watched by something. Let's just have a look at who's watching us. Hello, little kudu. Didn't even see you there. You snuck up on us. Come and watch this. It's really interesting. You'll be fascinated to see the byproducts of your, or the end part of the life cycle of your dung. Essentially, the clean-up operation of the bush. Kudu doesn't seem that interested, though. Fair enough. I am, though, so we're going to get a bit closer. Oh, hello, monkey orange. You OK there, Jandre? <laughs> She made life easier for him. Move the stick out of his way. There we go. Okay. Now I'm a bit too close. Nevertheless, we get to see really how this is working. Look at all the flies that have gathered around them. Yep, you can see every now and again the movement of the dung ball. And then that's exactly what happens. You put your happens. You put your finger on it precisely. The dung ball starts off hollow. I mean, sorry, other way around. Starts off solid when the egg of the or the larvae of this dung beetle hatches, and it will slowly eat its way from the inside out until.
becomes more and more hollow. Now, Lynn, I'm going to just look for a picture of it in my book because there's some really nice examples of what dung balls look like after honey badgers have been through them. And I'm actually distracted again by a really beautiful moth. Hold on. I'm just going to try and get it up without you. You keep watching the dung beetles. I'm going to just try and lift it up a little bit. Just have a look at this since the action appears to have slowed down and our gentleman is taking a breather. This is the most beautiful little moth. Looks like a Dalmatian. Now I know that Brent told me what this is and I cannot for the life of me remember. A small white moth with the black dots. It will come to me. It's something like pepper, pepper something or polka something or something to do with the beautiful little black spots that's on it. Tiny little creature. I'm going to pop it back where it was. I don't want to send it flying off into the bush since it is daytime. I'm going to stay here with our dung beetle gentleman and keep monitoring it. But let's find out what Brent has to show us. And we'll be back here shortly. So we've stopped here. We're still in search of the Queen of Juma. I did have some tracks in the block, but I'll explain those now. But VM just pointed out how busy the civetry looks. And with all the millipedes after the rain, it seems like millipede is the main feature in the civet's diet. VM, can you get that? Hello? OK. So there's some little carrion beetles uh, that are detritus feeders. They feed off carcasses and dung. And they actually, that's the third one I've seen. The others actually buried themselves inside the dung and they are feeding off it. So I'm going to try to get how many different species of cr critter has been fed on here. And the amazing thing is you can see millipedes are dominating. And a nice big piece. Millipede. And civet is one of the only mammals, apart from certain forest dikers that occur in Central Africa, that is able to digest a millipede because of what they feed on. Oh, this is going to be a bit fun. Horns here, stand on top. Um, because of what they feed on, uh, the, the millipedes actually have a hydrogen cyanide. So I'm going to put the different things on the dash there. What the civet has been eating. So there we go. OK. So what we've got, of course, is a nice big piece of a millipede. There we go. Now, more interesting is, there we go, a bit of a dung beetle carapace. And the head of a dung beetle. So there's multiple different species of dung beetle in there. But another thing a civet eats that, ooh, that is fascinating to look at, if you have a look at that little, little piece there, just, oh, I'm losing all my, my toys to this wind. Okay, <laughs> so these two are from the same species, and okay, we, we're done with the dung beetles and the millipedes, so if they get lost, it's not too much of a problem. Okay, oh no, I've lost the main part, come back here. Okay, let's try stuff. So, there we go, that and that are from the same species as are these are from a different species of the same family. Now, this, I think, actually goes together. So this is from Epistothalamus glabrophons, the shiny burrowing scorpion. So that is the main part of the body, and that is one of the arms that holds the pedipulps, or pincers. Now, oh, my scorpion's a bit rusty. Now, this is from um, the bark scorpion, and that is one part of his claw. And I'm going to try see if I can. So I found them in separate. It could be from two different ones, but I was hoping it is from the same one. Oh, there we go. So it does fit in. Sorry, my fat fingers are not ideal for this. But you can see there, there's a gripping part of the scorpion's uh, pincers. And you can see pretty much the same principle as our jaw. So if we have a look there, you can see 
the bottom is completely stable, and we're in the opposite with our jaws at the top. So only one of the pincers actually moves. So this one will do the crushing like that uh, and catching of things, where that one will be stationary. So all the tendons and ligaments and muscles are attached only to one section of the pincers. So this is one of those dark little scorpions. I've, oh, the name has just departed my, my, em, my very empty brain, but uh, it is one of the, the bark scorpions, the very dark ones. We have seen them on the, on, on the bushwalk before. I remember finding one a few times. But look, very interesting. You can see all the different things that a civet eats. And look at that. The wind does the job of cleaning my dash for me. So let's continue on. Cool. Now that sort of call is a contact call between the different Franklins. It's basically them announcing their presence to the rest of the Franklin world, so to speak. It's like them saying hello and good morning. And it's a little bit later this morning just because it's been a cold and windy and cloudy start. So the dawn chorus has been delayed ever so slightly. While you were with Brent, we progressed probably another about quarter inch, roughly. And slowly disappearing, the dung walls almost become indistinguishable from the soil around it. There he goes, working away industriously. Can you imagine the strength that he must have? He's now about three inches underneath the ground and he's forcing soil up above the surface. Now this particular species of dung beetle, and the female's very busy, up. I think she's prepping for egg laying. This particular species of dung beetle, Zumi Jody was wondering how many eggs will she lay in this dung ball? And the answer is not that many. So they're not like other insect species that reproduce with huge numbers. They put this amount of effort in because it increases the survival rate of their offspring. And therefore they can lay, whether it be sort of between one and three eggs, it'll probably in this, because of the size of this, wow, look at that. That is sheer strength. Just imagine what the equivalent would have to be for a human. It's like us going a meter, digging a meter underground and then pushing the soil up rather than digging it up, pushing it up. He's almost managed it. He's almost completely put it under the ground. So she will, Sumi Jody, she will probably only lay about one egg, I would suggest, because that larvae needs all the help he can get or all the access to food that it can get in that dung ball. The larger the species of dung beetle, the smaller their clutch size. The Safari Dean has said, because I said it would be terribly tragic if another male snuck in now and mated with her. Safari Dean said it would be even more tragic if a bird were to come in and snatch up the female and disappear with her while the male was underground digging the dung ball away. Well, at least we can comfort ourselves in the, our presence here and observing this very intricate act that is part of the dung beetle. Wow, look at that. That's incredible. I cannot believe how much dirt he can shift. What? she does that's exactly what it looks like she's doing it looks like she's coating dirt around the side of the dung beetle that's what she's uh, the dung ball sorry that's what she's doing she's packing it around so that it forms almost like a clay like seal Simon has suggested that she might be loosening the soil around the edges in order to make it easier for the offspring to emerge. Simon, I don't think so. I think she's doing the opposite. I think she's packing it around the edge because when you do find dung balls that have been broken off, broken into, they have a really significant layer of soil around them. And I would suggest that they're capable of packing it together to the point that it almost forms a and hardens to form a cement-like substance. And in fact, I wonder if she hasn't already laid her eggs at some point during that process of him rolling her along the ground. 
the ability to multitask in that case would be very impressive. But it makes more sense because those dung beetles are only going to come out, or the, the, the larvae are only going to emerge in the next, next year, during the next rainy season. So they've got a couple of months still to go. So any loosening of the soil she would do would have long ago been undone by the actions of other animals, and she probably wants it as compact as possible to hide the scent of her dung beetle larvae in there. So she isn't just lazily sitting, letting the dung, the male dung beetle do all the work. She also has a bit of a role to play, admittedly not quite as strenuous as his. This is so fascinating to witness. Now there's different species, as I said, there's different species of dung beetles. Some utilize this method. Others will sit right in the middle of the pile of dung itself and dig straight down below the dung rather than forming it into a ball and carrying it off. They will then just dig down, lay their eggs and sort of compact that tunnel underneath the dung with dung around their larvae or around their eggs. This is a very interesting approach. I think that's what she's doing. She's compacting it around there. Uh, we discussed the effectiveness of the way in which he was digging. And Ganiac has suggested that this is the most effective way to do it because he's simultaneously digging and put sort of burying the dung ball at the same time. It's a very, very valid point. I mean, that dung ball in the time that we've been here has all but disappeared. This has been so interesting to witness. Maybe Ganiac it is, you know, to be completely honest, who am I to argue with the method with which a dung beetle approaches this particular process? I've always found it very strange that male dung beetles walk on their front legs and push with their back legs so that they have to keep stopping and putting their heads up over the dung balls in order to see where they're going. I've never understood why exactly it is that they've evolved that way. Clearly it's within their body structure that their front legs are nice and strong. Maybe it leaves them with their front legs free to defend the dung ball. I don't know. Either way, I've always found that an interesting aspect of the way in which they've evolved. And I mean, she's nearly done now. She's actually moved away, I think she's actually moved away from the dung ball now. I want to see if she's going to, at some point, abandon him to this. Or, no, she's going back on again. Marilyn, that is absolutely fascinating. Marilyn has observed something that I haven't been watching, but now in hindsight is absolutely the case. Marilyn's observed that the dung beetle has dug in a clockwise direction, going round and round, removing the dirt that way. How interesting is that? I wonder if all dung, dung beetles dig in a clockwise direction. They probably all have a consistent rotation, but do they all do it clockwise or do some do it anti-clockwise? Do the rebels do it anti-clockwise? There he goes. It's, Marilyn, you're exactly right. Well done. That's an incredible observation. It's exactly what he's done. I would never in a million years have guessed, the, uh, guessed at that. What is she doing? She's doing something. Is she gathering more dirt to put, to sort of layer on top of it? She, you're right, she is also moving in a clockwise direction. You can see how built for that design she is. Just bear with me a second, I want to just check something. I've had this dung, dead dung beetle in my car for quite an extended period of time. And I've just been trying to see if it's the same species. It's not quite. But I'm just looking at the way in which that shovel-nosed face would be, oopsie, 
would be adapted for this whole process that we've witnessed. Certainly those grips along the front, powerful front legs, definitely would be of huge assistance. But now I'm, I understand better the shape to the face that this dung beetle has. Almost, but not quite, our dung beetle species that we're watching now. Interesting. Such incredibly powerful front limbs and rear limbs. We chatted a lot about this the other day. I keep forgetting to return this particular dead dung beetle to the earth. It's stuck in, been stuck in the vehicle for a while. Hinged almost like our, the way in which we design robots, the way we understand robots and limbs. That's the way these limbs work. Imagine the range of motion they need to have to be able to hoist that soil up. I'm more fascinated by dung, and I've always been fascinated by dung beetles. Having witnessed that, I'm more impressed by them is maybe a better way of, of mentioning this or describing the way that I feel about them. This has been a truly fascinating experience. She's still busy. She has not abandoned him yet. She's shoveling with her head. She's actually pushing. She stopped pulling dirt over the top and she started pushing some of it away. So she is, in the way that Simon was sort of suggesting, she is now moving the bits away from the edges. She's no longer been compacting the dirt on top of the dung wall. She's now pushing it away, shoveling it away. Oh, there goes the male again. Big push. He's incredible. I would love to know the amount of weight that he's pushing up over his back. Is she going to shovel some more? a bit about Marilyn's comment about the fact that they've gone or the males dug clockwise I course suggested maybe the dung beetles in Australia go counterclockwise <laughs> I think that's very funny now she's going right underneath she is there she goes she's gonna go down is she gonna go down to join him are they going to mate there, and then is she going to lay her eggs down there? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> well, our dung beetle action's nearly over, and there's some elephants drinking at a water hole. So here we go. We've got some great grey beasts, a really nice big breeding herd. Just started drinking nice cool weather for them. This particular group seems nice and relaxed. Just watch that bulb outside of you, behind you. Just looks a little bit full of nonsense. He might be in must. It's not the naughty boy there. So if we sit nice and quietly, they might engulf us, and wouldn't that be wonderful? We did have a wonderful elephant sighting on the sunset safari yesterday. And always wonderful to, to spend time with Ellie's again. And it is amazing, you learn about elephants every time you see them. There might be some little nuance in the body language that you pick up that you might not have seen before, and if you have, you might not have noticed it before. You have to be particularly careful in this windy weather but so far their body language is looking great we might get some fun from these three little trouble four or five little troublemakers that are heading straight towards us hello little nonsenses look at this isn't this amazing so the little ones are so curious 
And look how many youngsters there are here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there's a little one right in the middle. Oh, and a big female coming now. You can see very nice, relaxed body language. Look how she's opened her ears like that. Isn't this special? They are looking like they're going to engulf us. Vim, look, the little one's having a drink. Here we go. Look at that. So there's Ellie's now behind us, to the left of us. This is very special. And you can see, there we go. Here comes nonsense. And it is amazing. You can see. We always watch the adults' body language, not the little ones. The little ones might make some noise and charge the vehicles. But if we look at her, you can just see she's really nice and relaxed. And it is nice to find a herd like this, especially in this strong wind. And there's some feeding to the right. Again, in front of us. Sorry, they just moved so the little one's got a gap. It's going to drink less than five feet from us. Isn't this absolutely special? Yeah. Oh, yes. Look at that. So, probably close on a year, judging from the size. Oh, drank the milk a little bit too quickly there. Had to have a little cough. Thirsty little chap. So we actually physically can't move. There's elephant directly behind us, to the right, to the left, and directly in front of us. And there's no spot I would rather be than sitting in the middle of this herd. Look at those wonderful eyelashes. Uh, those long any eyelashes are there for a reason, just to protect uh, their eyes when they put their heads deep into thickets. Look, she's got some grass. Now, sniffing at a spike thorn. There we go. Down the gullet it goes. So look at that. There's a, just to let you know, there is an Ellie to, passing directly behind them. And there's another little one. It almost looks like he's stalking us from behind. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but just enjoy the ones in front of us. If I am mentioning elephants you can't see, guys, it is for the virtual reality rig. Oh, look down underneath. <laughs> it's got an itchy, itchy nose. It could even be a little bit of teething that's causing him to push his mouth into the ground like that. Yeah, some big grey bottoms. Yes, mister. I'm just going to pop the little beeper so for the virtual reality. Switch it on. Switch it on. It's not working again. So I'm just going to have to click my fingers quickly as those Ellie's walk away. So we've got something for the virtual reality to sync. The audio with. Is that enough, Em? No, I think we need to just tap. Is that OK? There we go. So in so many access, do I understand how incredibly lucky I am to spend the time with these amazing animals? That I do. And every time I see elephants, I am overjoyed. And having sightings like that is incredibly special. Uh, I'm going to move backwards a little bit, see if we can get back into the herd. So, ooh, very important. You'll notice I let my engine run for a few seconds before moving. And that's just to make sure that the Ellie's know that I'm not up to any mischief. So we've got some little ones behind us. 
and I'm just going to swing. Let's just make sure we don't surprise one around the corner. Hello, Mama. Okay, so directly behind us, this is as far as we can go, there's another elephant behind us. And then we'll try to show you now. There we go. So that big female, she's got a very ripped ear. We have seen her a few times before. And uh, lots of them. And after they've had a drink now, it looks like they're going to spread out. And it's not uncommon to find a big herd of ellies like this covering a distance of about half a kilometer, sometimes quite far from each other. And there's a little one there, a little female, and disappearing behind it. A little bush below that the bigger elephants have pushed over. Okay, so I think they're going to be heading slowly towards the Mawati. I'm going to see, oh, there I'm on the right. We've got some little youngsters just around eight, nine years old feeding there. Very special elephant herds, and it is incredible. We do have such fantastic elephant sightings here. But as I always say, you've got to be careful. We do get elephants that come in from the western edge of Kruger, and always important to watch the body language before you get too close. Otherwise, you could get find yourself in a compromising position. So Anna Marie says, isn't that amazing? That mother elephant was so at ease letting the tiny calf nurse next to the vehicle. Well, Anna Marie, uh, with, with most animals, if you drive respectfully around them and you don't give them any reason to be upset with you, they will give you the opportunity to get close. So I'm going to move now and see if we can catch up with them again in the Mawati riverbed. We saw that little calf nursing, and Megan would like to know how long do they nurse for? So, oh, there we go. They nurse to just over two years, uh, sometimes a bit longer. It all just depends on the individual. Look at this. Look, he's got a stick in his mouth. Oh, playing with it more than eating it. You got a little fight, that one. It's okay. Oh, look at that. Reaching up, feeding off the buffalo thorn. Now, those trees are also known in Afrikaans as a wache biki bos. And what that means is a wait a bit tree. So they've got a straight thorn and a hooked thorn. And if you do get stuck in one, it takes quite a while to remove yourself from it, hence the name wait a bit tree but you can see those sharp thorns do nothing uh, to an elephant's mouth and 
and it's one of the, one of the elephant's favorite tree species to feed on, specifically uh, during the dry season. It's one of our, our evergreens and provides very important food for not only the elephants, but also kudu, inyala, bushbuck, and impala. Wind is just suddenly picked up immensely. Oh, look at that tiny little guy. There, off he goes. So it's lovely to see relaxed elephants. Oh, there's a bit of a game game going on behind that bottle. Just reverse it. Oh no, they're gonna come out all by themselves. <laughs> there we go. Three different bottoms in a row. So Linda is wondering, do elephants aloe suckle? So for those of you not sure what aloe suckling is, it's when they will let a, non, a calf that's not theirs suckle off them. Hello, mister. He's got a thorn stuck to his nose. Here we go, now you got it. Uh-uh. You, my friend, are a little bit close. Here we go. So often just a little tap on the side of the vehicle will stop them developing bad habits. Oh, look at these two little boys. Having a little bit of a pushing match up there. So this was that, that guy who came very close to us as a young bull. And he was getting very, very close. Oh, he's got a sore leg. Look at that. And we saw a small injury in his nose, but the leg looks much worse. See how he's back right. Doesn't look very good. He's keeping it very straight, not bending it at all. Probably hurt himself play fighting with other bulls of his. Similar edge, like those two were doing up on top. There we go. Well, it looks like the one on top is thinking about a charge down the bank. Now that's a bit of serious playing going on. <laughs> that was very funny. Uh, circus elephants. And but no, she looks like she might do it again. But she didn't put too much weight. It looked like she carried a lot of the weight on her back legs rather than on the little guy. Let's have a sit, sit down. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Poof. <laughs> so, isn't that wonderful? You do see younger elephants doing this type of stuff. Um, as they're older with that big weight, it's very difficult to get up. But I'm just having a bit of fun. And you can see, even at that young age, they've still got to roll and uh, to get themselves back upright. It just left, looks like that little lady is having a whale of a time. And see how she chose a spot with a slight embankment that might make it easier for her to get up. Here we go. <laughs> that was wonderful. So the main body of the herd is disappearing, but we've still got these young boys. These guys look like they're probably around 20-ish, hanging on the peripheries. See, and that's why. You can see them poking each other with the 
tusks there. There's the guy with a stiff leg walking off. Hello, boys. Shame. You can't go and play with everyone else just because you're too boisterous. So far too many hormones flowing through them, so they can get a little bit difficult, and that's why the females generally prefer them to be on the edge of the herds and not in the middle. Here we go. Just like that. Listen to that ivory clash. Now, in big elephant bulls, when you often see a broken tusk, it is from clashes like this. At this age, <coughs> it's, oh, excuse me. it's not so serious, it's more play fighting, but of course as they get older and they have to fight for breeding rights, that's a lot more serious. So we're going to move around to see if we can catch up with the rest of the herd on the open side, and while we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Sounds like a magical elephant sighting. In the meantime, we have left our dung beetle pair to their business. Both of them disappeared off underground to do whatever it is dung beetles do underground whilst attempting to produce and lay offspring in their dung ball. They're still digging frantically when we left them. She'd, he'd only really managed to get the dung ball about that far underneath the surface of the ground. So I think still a little bit of work to be done. So, these any bulls are starting to get a little bit more serious in their pushing and shoving. So we're just going to stand by here, they might... Oh, there's a tusk in the bottom. Now this is just playing and you, if they do, do have a little bit of serious playing, you'll see the immense power that these animals possess. Oh, he tried to do a sneak attack, <laughs> but he was, look at that. Listen to that ivory clashing. Now, quite often in these games, when one is the obvious loser, the third sometimes charges in from behind on a sneak attack. Ooh. Dancing on the precipice. There's a big drop there, boys. Say when we You can see they're on top of quite a high bank. It would be quite amusing if one happened to stand a little bit too close to the edge. And the, the, the bank collapsed. So still not very serious. Still more playful than professional. going to sneak up from behind. He has come closer. Siberia Zumi says, am I sure all these ellies haven't got in to some fermented marula fruit? Well, Siberia, firstly, it would take marula fruit to do that. We've had almost none this year because of the dry conditions early on. Secondly, elephants cannot... Oh, here comes the sneak. Tusk in the bottom. Oh, nearly. Uh, elephants cannot get drunk on fermented marula fruit. That was a, a rumor started by a movie made in the 70s, if I remember correctly, called Beautiful People. 
by a South African filmmaker by the name of Jamie Ace. And uh, that, I think that movie did quite well internationally. And what actually happened is that those elephants that looked like they were drunk were actually drugged. Um, they were part of a capture thing, so when elephants are under sedation for movement, they do look like they are possibly drunk. And that was how it happened. And the baboons that got drunk were actually the <laughs> feeding off spiked marula fruit. Obviously, oh, uh, things have changed a bit since then. Uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, do that anymore. But there was a, I think it was Harvard or Yale, I can't remember exactly who did a study on elephants getting drunk on marula fruit. But let's just, I'll discuss that now. Let's just watch these boys. All three of them there now. Jamie, you can go past me, see if you can catch up with the rest of the breeding herd around Chilipan. So Jamie's are coming past. We're going to stay with these boys, and Jamie is going to go see if she can find the rest of the herd. So it looks like... The, there goes Jamie and Jandre. So it looks like the majority of the boxing is over. They split up a little bit and started feeding. And the others are moving through. So I think Jamie is probably going to be in the best position to get a view of them if they do pop out on the other side of these thickets. driving directly behind her because it's the only route out of here and as soon as Jamie gets a view we will jump across so let's jump on with Jamie and see if she finds the elephants first let us see what we can find and whether or not this elephant herd has popped out where Brent has suggested that they might Lots of tracks going back the other way. But it seems as though most of the herd went across towards the Chelepan. This is almost like the Great Lakes district of Juma. Perhaps a slight exaggeration, but there's so many pans and muddy holes around this particular block. The Great Puddles district is maybe a better, a better description. Lots of tracks coming back down this way. I'll just check a little bit further ahead in the road, see if they're around there. There you go, there's another great puddle, the puddle district. We've been, Brent's been with these. Sorry, hold on one second. Brent's just chatting to me. He's saying they've come out closer towards Chele Pan. Um, so we've been watching those elephants, those young bulls, clash with Brent. We know that the tusks are extended teeth. Hello, everybody. that the tusks are the equivalent of an incisor tooth, I'm oh, sorry, a canine tooth. And yes, Tammy, if an elephant breaks its tusk, it would be incredibly painful, as painful as it would be for us to chip or to break a tooth. Hello, gorgeous girls. This is such a beautiful setting. Trying to find a nice spot so we can watch them. There's a little one drinking. And Tammy, a lot of 
aggressive elephant incidents. Now, they're fairly few and far between, but very often an elephant has been found to be exceptionally aggressive only because it's discovered afterwards that it has an abscess in the base of its tusk. So if they crack or break a tusk, it immediately opens the possibility up for infection. And those big pus-filled abscesses that form on people can form on elephants too, and it's exceptionally painful. Are you having fun there? This is such a beautiful setting. The first time I've ever seen this pan with water, proper water. All the Franklins want to do this morning is interrupt my sentences. Perhaps they're trying to tell me something. Perhaps we should just enjoy this sighting in silence for a bit. Enjoying the long grasses around the edge of the pan. So, Linda, Brent, sorry, you didn't have a chance to fully finish the answer to your question about elephants' aloe suckling. Now, Linda, elephants are so fascinating in this respect because, no, they won't. They won't aloe suckle each other's youngsters, but they will do what is known as aloe mothering. I just want to have a look at that bird that is, sorry, give me one second, I'm going to grab binoculars. I've also been distracted. Poor Linda. Every time one of us tries to answer a question, we get distracted by something else. Sorry, Linda. I promise I'll be back with you. So whilst they will not feed a calf that is not there, again, that's a general description of elephant behavior. Can I say for with 100% certainty that it has never happened ever before in the world? No, I can't. There is the possibility that maybe a mother might allow another calf to suckle, but generally, no, they do not allow suckle. I've never seen it happen. I don't know of anyone who has ever witnessed such behavior. But they do do what's known as aloe mothering, particularly the young female elephants of around, sort of from about six years old on. Once new calves are born, whether it's a sibling or a younger cousin, they will spend a lot of time practicing their mothering skills on them. So they'll look after the little ones, and we've seen that multiple times on these live safaris where a a younger elephant will run up and keep the calf in check, maybe encourage it to play or play with it or wrap her trunk around its head and cuddle it. Uh, they, whilst they allow mother, and they allow mother very fiercely, they do not allow suckle each other's babies. And the, in that way, they also enforce the bonds between different members of the herds, and that's essential. That's why anywhere that you find a closed system with a contraception program for the elephants, so in other words, a reserve that has to control its elephant numbers because having too many of them in a small closed off area is not a good thing. But you'll find that any reserve that does implement process or a practice of contracepting their elephants will never ever contracept every single member of the herd. So they'll never deny the young females the chance to have offspring initially because they're so important. Her tusks, this particular female's tusks are particularly sharp, almost like spears. As we sit and enjoy a really peaceful elephant sighting around this lovely setting, Siberia Zoomies been looking closely underneath the elephant's chin or around underneath their trunk and has remarked, he's remarked upon the number of hairs that are around the elephant's lower lip. Now they're essentially whiskers in a way. So an elephant needs them there because they have a complete blind spot they can see there. So those extra tufts of hair, the almost beard-like growth, is a way of providing extra sensory perception around their mouths. So when they're learning to use their trunks and coordinate that process of putting trunk to mouth, as this little Ellie's doing with water. <laughs> little 
fountain. He's just having fun as well. <laughs> it's very entertaining to watch. So Siberia Zuvi, especially when sticking your mouth straight towards a tree full of thorns, it helps to help them to coordinate it. So, James Richard, you've said you can't begin to imagine what it feels like to be surrounded by a herd of elephants and that it is definitely on your bucket list. It's one of my favorite experiences in the whole wide world. Fortunately, it's something that I get to experience on a regular basis. There's a beauty and a peace to it, edged with an awareness of just how much bigger they are than you. And just how fortunate we are that, we, that they allow us to have experiences like this. To be surrounded by these curious creatures, so unique out here, and yet with such a sentient capacity to the way in which they act around each other and around with us. There's no other animal out here that interacts with us on the level that elephants do. Whether it be the young calves entertaining themselves by trying to scare us, or the females communicating their boundaries and their protectiveness of their herd with very, very clear signals. And I would say that there is no other animal that we are able to communicate with as well as we are, or at least that is able to communicate with us as well as elephants are in this particular context. They tell us everything we need to know about the way that they're feeling. Linda's also loving this elephant sighting as well as the long eyelashes of the little elephants. Hello, Mischief. Hello. Oh, you're being guided by Mom. She's going to come right up underneath this tree where the long grass is. Now, Linda, I also really, really love long, the long eyelashes of the elephants. They definitely have an impressive set. I think even with false eyelashes, none of us would be quite able to reach the level that they do. Hello, good girl. Okay. Trying to get hold of that tree and it keeps blowing away from you. Yes, gorgeous. Those long eyelashes serving exactly a perfect example of what they do. Thank you very much, girl. That's exactly what you I was about to talk about protecting the eye when faced with thorn trees like this buffalo thorn. Now we're coming to the end of our sunrise safari, so I'm going to say a big thank you both on my behalf and on Brent's behalf as well to our wonderful cameraman, Jean-Dre, on my vehicle and Viam on my vehicle. And we're going to be starting our sunset safari five minutes earlier this afternoon due to having another school class on board with us once again. Definitely a really exciting opportunity. Thank you to Louise and Jerry in final control for all of their work. And most importantly, thank you for joining us on this wonderful windy morning out on Juma. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and we'll catch up with you in a couple of hours. Cheers.